Okay. And we're in the Gospel of John once again, and we're in session six this evening. That's for the tip's sake. <laughs> you have your notes, you know what session we're in, but for those who maybe be listening uh, later on on the internet. You'll see there from your page of notes tonight that um, I'm beginning there with, uh, where are we at? Yeah, John 3, verses 1 to 21. Let me just recap by making one point before we move. I said to you the last week, at the beginning of the session last week, that in John chapter 3, John presents the Lord Jesus Christ in three different roles. And that's really what we're looking at tonight. We spent last week looking at a bit of structure of the book and stuff like that again. We we're back into that. And tonight, really, what we're going to do is we're just going to take a walk through chapter 3. It's as simple as that. And to be much of what we look at tonight, in fact, most of what we look at tonight, you will know already, but it's just to highlight stuff and just to bring stuff together for you. But John presents Jesus in this chapter in three different roles. And so from verse 1 to 21, he presents him as the teacher. Then in verses 22 to 30, he presents him as the bridegroom. And in verses 31 to 36, he presents him as the witness. And that's what we're going to work our way through this evening. Now, at the beginning of the chapter, verses 1 to 21, deals with Nicodemus. The story of Nicodemus, we, we know well about Nicodemus. There was a man, verse 1, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. I think some translations have that, a teacher of the Jews, perhaps, but that's who he was. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do, except God be with him. Okay, so he's a leader, he's a Pharisee, and Jesus teaches him about what real spiritual life really is. A man who was in that position. Just something to note, by the way. Now, verse 2, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. And that poses a question and I'm only throwing this out at you because I don't know the answer to it. I don't think anybody else does either. Did he really come for himself? Or did he come as a representative for a group of people? There's one for you. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know what the answer to that is. And as I say, none of the commentators I ever read know that either. But I'm just, I'm just mentioning that. We know, you know, that, that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do, except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, verse 3, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, what we find here is Jesus mentions birth, okay? Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Jesus is about to, to teach Nicodemus to tell him about real spiritual life and how you get real spiritual life and how you get in touch with God and all of those things. And throughout the discourse that he has here with Nicodemus, Jesus is going to use four different illustrations to instruct Nicodemus in these verses in the basics of salvation. And so we have, I've grouped them together for you there. Number one, we're going to look at birth for a moment or two. And he touches on the new birth here, verses 1 to 7. Now, we know this story. All right, we know the verses. We're not going to take our time to, to read every single verse here. But Jesus says, except a man be born again. And you will know that that phrase, born again, can also be translated born anew. And it can also be translated born from above. All of those aspects of it are completely right, and it depends on what translation you use. The Dewey Bible in the Roman Catholic Church talks about being born from above. That's what they use in this particular verse. And all of those renderings, all of those translations are completely right. But the point is this, and you know these things. As we have a human birth, or as we have a natural birth, Jesus is saying here, so also we need a new birth. We need a, a spiritual birth. Look at verse 5 for a moment. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
We need a spiritual birth, and we know that tonight. We're saved people, and we know what that is. We know what that brings into the life, and we have experienced that in our own experience. Whenever Jesus uses the words there, born of water and of the Spirit, let me make something very clear. He is not talking there about baptism, because a baptism does do nothing as far as removing sins are concerned or anything at all like that. And in fact, in the New Testament, you will always find that baptism is associated by is associated with death and not birth. Because in baptism over in the book of Romans, it talks about us being buried with Christ and raised in newness of life. So, so baptism always has to do with death. Now, why does he mention the word water, born of water and of the Spirit there in verse 5? What is water? It's hard to know, and there are different thoughts in that. The Bible talks about the washing of water by the Word, and the Word of God has got a cleansing effect upon the life. Now, we have to remember here that Jesus is the living Word of God. And so the things that Jesus has to say can bring a person into that state where they'll be cleansed. You know, it goes but with faith, hand in hand, they go together. And Jesus is the living word. In our situation today, we read the word, we hear the word preached, and someone comes to faith again through believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's the word of God that does that. And perhaps there's a reference there. The water may tie in perhaps with that. The other thing that's possible is the fact that John the Baptist has been baptizing. And it is a baptism unto the remission of sins. And John was encouraging people to repent of sin and be baptized. And it's quite possible that that could be a reference to the activities of John the Baptist, whereby the baptism doesn't mean the forgiveness of sins, but the repentance means the forgiveness of sins. And the baptism is a sign, the baptism in water is the sign for the people that they have done that in their own hearts. Those are just two possibilities. I'm going to stop for a minute. Has anybody got any other thoughts on that? Just as a matter of interest. Well, down here, I was always told that Nicodemus wouldn't have recognised John's baptism because he was a Pharisee. It would have made no sense. And because he was a Pharisee and so familiar with the law, the verses like Ezekiel 36, who sprinkling clean water over them, Given a new heart, that was what mm -hmm. Jesus was trying to bring. I bring, bring Nicodemus into there. That's fair enough. I did. You every, did everybody hear that there? Give us that again, David. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Come up and take a bite. <laughs> no, seriously, no. Just, just share, share that again there. Go on ahead. Well, I was always told that because Nicodemus was a Pharisee, yeah. he wouldn't have recognized John's, John's baptism. John's baptism. So the, the, you know, the baptism. Or the, the water being baptism didn't make sense, but he's a Pharisee, so he's familiar with the Old Testament and the verses like uh, Ezekiel Is 36, mm -hmm. one Isaiah about water as well. Mm -hmm. And that was what Jesus was I could be refer I refer and pointing back to that. A new uh -huh. heart and pouring spirit out. Right, aye, that's, fa that's fair enough. Any, anything else, anybody? I'm just asking, you know, because. I, I must admit it baffles me. I've looked at a number of things there, you know, and and, and you, you, you wonder, whenever I say you wonder about it, you, you think about it and you think it could be this, it could be that, but I don't think any of us are really sure that that's really what it is, you know. And David, that's that's a very good good way of looking at it there, good point. Any others, anybody? No? Yes? You didn't expect me to ask you that tonight, sure you <coughs> Or you'd have come all prepared for that. <laughs> Whenever we used to do Bible studies at one of our previous church, we would give out what particular verses we were working on. And everybody had a homework to do that week, and then they came to the Bible study, and everybody chipped in their bit and, and all the rest of it. And that was the way we did them there. But anyway, now just, I just wanted, to, just wanted to check to see if anyone had, had any other thoughts on, on that at all. But irrespective, it's, it's a new birth. It's a spiritual birth. It's water and the Spirit. And thanks, David, for that contribution. And you can give people, you can give people the references and all for that. They'll want to write all that in their notes as well. So they will. But there you are. No, but it's good to cover. It's good to look at different things and different aspects like that. So 
Jesus goes on, you see, in, in his discourse with Nicodemus, Jesus then goes on from that. He mentions uh, being born of water and of the Spirit, but he moves on from that and he talks about the need to believe and he talks about faith. And you find that in the section from verses 14 down to 21, among that verses that we know so well. Um, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Look at verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So in, in, in this rebirth, water in the Spirit, there's this element of faith, and we know Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, uh, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So this element of faith, this element of belief, has to come into the whole situation. And that faith brings the life and brings the witness of the Spirit into the individual life. Now, Having said that, let me say this. Human birth involves travail. And any of you ladies who are here who have children, you don't need me to tell you that. But look at chapter 16 for a moment of John. Chapter 16, just to highlight that. Verse 21. It says, A woman when she is in travail... She has sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And so in, in, in natural birth, natural birth involves travail, and so does birth from above. Jesus had to travail, we know, upon the cross, so that people like you and I could become believers could become members of the family of God. And you needn't go back to look at it there, but I have given it to you somewhere. No? Yes. Isaiah, so at the far side. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11. We know that chapter. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And in verse 11 of that chapter, it says, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. So in many ways, what Jesus did upon the cross was the travail that brings to birth or brings a person to new birth to be alive in him. Then also, the other aspect or the other thought of that is that we as believers are to travail in prayer and in witness for others to be saved. And Paul picks up on that. If you go to Galatians <coughs> chapter 4, just to cite a verse that Paul mentions just on the way through. Galatians 4, verse 19. The Apostle Paul says, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. So there's this aspect of, of, of travail and pain. And you know, it, it all has to do with, with prayer and the kind of prayer that we engage in. And perhaps that's something that we're we're not good enough at, and perhaps there's a whole aspect of prayer there that maybe we know very, very, very little about. But nevertheless, there's this whole thought of travail whenever it comes to birth with the spiritual birth, just the same as there is with the human birth. In human birth, the child inherits the nature of the parents, and so does the child of God. Look at Second Peter chapter 1. And as I said, look, a lot of this stuff, most of this stuff, you'll know it tonight, but it's really just to pull a lot of it together. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Second Peter 1 and verse 4. It says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We become partakers of his nature, the nature, the spiritual birth, the nature of the Holy Spirit, 
the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, the nature of God the Father. Three, they're all, they're, they're all one. And so we have that aspect of it as well. Whenever you think about nature, let me just move that screen on to, to the next one for you. Whenever you think about nature, nature determines appetite. And that's why the Christian has an appetite for the things of God. Go to 1 Peter this time. I bet you you're sorry you turned your book back, aren't you? You turned the Bible. <laughs> Where are we at here? 1 Peter chapter 2. And this time is verses 2 and 3. Now, John will be sitting smiling at this verse. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 2. Oh, I'm reading verse. John, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 1 there. Elect according to yeah. Chapter 2. <laughs> okay. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And so be ye, if so be, that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. There's an appetite for the things of God, an appetite for the Word of God. And as believers feed upon that Word of God, uh, there's a verse in Hebrews, if you want to go to Hebrews chapter 5, and that's just really to do with maturity. Hebrews chapter 5, and there's verse 11. Hebrews 5 verse 11 of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so there's stuff in the word for the new babe in Christ, but there's also stuff in the word for those who are maturing and those who are moving on in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and nature brings all of that with it. There'll be an appetite and there'll also be maturing. And so Jesus uses a, the whole idea of birth. But the next thing that we see here is that birth involves life. Birth involves life. And we know that it's eternal life. Go back to John. You can go back to John chapter 3 now. I bet you were still holding your fingers in Hebrews just again. Okay, John, John chapter 3 again. Look at verse 26. Sorry, 25. Aye, sorry. Sorry? Sorry? John 1. John 5 and 26. I beg you for I haven't got 5. I just have verse 26 right now. Forgive me. Thanks. John 5, verse 26. Yeah. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. Okay? So birth, the new birth involves life, and it's God's life. The Father has Son in Himself. The Father, the Father has life in Himself. The Father, the Bible refers to Him as being the fountain of life. In other words, all life flows from God. And that verse says to us, For as the Father has life in Himself, so has He given to the Son to have life in Himself. In other words, Jesus walked this scene of time. You may not agree with this thought, but I'm going to throw this at you anyway. Jesus was sent into this world and Jesus walked this scene of time and embodied. The Bible says, in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And in a human frame, Jesus had the fullness of life contained in himself that he can give life to whoever he wants to give it to. Does that make sense to you? And yet I believe that's exactly what the Bible teaches. That verse says, as the Father has life in himself. Now I know the Father is God, Jesus is God, they are one, and the Holy Spirit is one with them and so on. But as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. And he sent Jesus into this word with the fullness of life, everything to do with life, parceled up, 
in the human frame of our Lord Jesus Christ, incarnate in the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he had the power to walk in that life and he had the power to bestow that life upon anyone that he wanted to bestow it upon. John uses, by the way, John uses the word life. I think I've given it to you yet. I have. John uses the word life in his gospel something like 36 times. So it's something that's very, very relevant to what, what John has in mind as he speaks this to us. But on birth also involves a future. Aren't you glad about that? Praise God. 1 Peter 1. We're almost at that verse now, John. 1 Peter chapter 1. One Peter chapter one, and we're in verse three. In fact, maybe we should read verse two, as well as verse three. <laughs> okay, it says, "Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ." which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope or a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Thank God we're not just saved, but we're saved for something that's still up in the future. Isn't that right? It's a living hope. It's a glorious hope. And the hope that the Bible talks about and we've mentioned this many times, it's not you and me hoping to be there tomorrow or it's not you and me hoping to do something. The, by, the hope that the Bible talks about is actually a certainty. It can't fail, we can't miss it, it's a certainty and it's up ahead there for us. And so birth also includes for us a future. We're saved, we're given this birth into, into the spiritual family of Almighty God. We're given the nature of Almighty God. We have an appetite for His Word. We are to mature through the Word. We have an appetite for the things of God. We have His life dwelling within us. And thank God we have a future before us that's glorious and it's absolutely certain. Amen. Amen. Now what a thought or what a truth that really is. So anyway, Jesus uses that whole concept of birth. And we didn't, we didn't read the verses there, all of them in John chapter 3, because you'll probably know the story and know many of the verses so well. But let's move on just very, very quickly. Jesus also uses now, as he's still talking to Nicodemus, he also uses the, the illustration of the wind. And he speaks that from verses 8 uh, down through into verse 13. Let's just read those verses. He says, The wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but you cannot tell whence it comes and whither it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And those verses Jesus speaks Begins, or begins to speak to him about the wind. Now, the word wind can also be translated both in the Hebrew and in the Greek. It can be translated as the word spirit. And you will find that one of the symbols for spirit in the Bible is the wind or is breath. Go to Job chapter 33 for a moment. Job chapter 33. That's just to the left of the book of Psalms. Job 33. And look at verse 4. You there? Job 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. Okay, wind, breath, and spirit. Go back in your New Testament to John chapter 20, and you know this verse well. 
because this is Jesus after his resurrection. And he appears in the room with his disciples. John 20, verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. Then you needn't look at this one, but over in Acts chapter 2, we know that on the day of Pentecost, they were all with one accord in one place. And verse 2 says, And suddenly there came the sound as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were. The Holy Spirit had been poured out upon them. So wind and spirit, the, the, these words are, are, are synonymous. They, they go together. And like the wind, Jesus says to Nicodemus here, like the wind, the spirit is invisible, but he's powerful. And you can't predict the movements of the wind. And Jesus says you can't predict the movements of the spirit either. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I just wonder, did Nicodemus, as Jesus shared that with him, I wonder, did Nicodemus think about Ezekiel's vision back in the Old Testament? Ezekiel chapter 37. You know the valley of, of dry bones? You know that, that scripture? Turn back there for just, just a moment or two. Ezekiel chapter 37. The whole thing's included in verses 1 to 14. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he to me, and it's these, these two verses really that I'm thinking of here. Then said he to me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our part for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. But it's those two verses, really, verses 9 and 10. Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, and O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. The wind is invisible. We don't know where it comes from, where it goes to. The Spirit can move in exactly the same way. And as I say, I just wonder, because is he, uh, not Ezekiel, <laughs> Nicodemus would have been very familiar with that vision of Ezekiel. 
And as Jesus speaks about the wind and what happens and so on, I just wonder, did that come into his mind, perhaps, about the Spirit of God and what God can do in that situation? But it was a combination of the Spirit and the Word of God that gave life in that prophecy in Ezekiel at chapter 37. And so Jesus, we find, he has used the illustration of birth, he has used the illustration of wind, and we're really, just, we're really just walking our way through this, so we are. And then Jesus uses the serpent on the pole. And he uses that in verses 14 to 18 of chapter 3. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, a, have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The serpent on the pole. You find that story back in Numbers chapter 21. Maybe we'll just we'll just maybe just go there and read that. Although again you'll know the story. Numbers chapter 21. Are you there? That's okay. Verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loathes this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looks upon it, he shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Okay, and that's the story that we have there about the, the certain serpent of brass. Now, Nicodemus would have known that story as well. And Jesus has said to him, as Moses lifted up, in this, uh, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And the story itself there in the book of Numbers, it's a, it's a story about sin. The nation has spoken against God. They have spoken against Moses. They have rebelled against God and what God was doing. And because of that, judgment has been pronounced upon them. But with that judgment and grace, God provided the remedy made a serpent of brass, and he put it on a pole. Now, in John chapter 3, verse 14, if you want to go back there, it says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Those words lifted up have actually got a, have got a dual meaning. Because lifted up means to be crucified there, but lifted up also means to be glorified or to be <coughs> exalted. If you go to John chapter 8 for a moment or two, and look at verse 28, Jesus says, Then said Jesus unto them, John 8, verse 28, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. 
Slip on across to chapter 12, verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abides forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? And the significance of this story, of course, is the fact that they, the solution to the problem that the people had, that Moses had to deal with back in Numbers, the, the solution to the serpent problem for Moses in Numbers was not the killing of the serpents. Okay, it wasn't the making of medicine to correct what had happened to the people. It wasn't the passing of, of anti-serpent laws. That's what we would do in these days, isn't it? It wasn't those things. It wasn't even trying to climb up the pole to the serpent. No, it was the answer was looking by faith at the serpent, at the uplifted serpent. And so that's the significance that Jesus is speaking of there. And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Look again at John chapter 12 and look at verse 23 this time. We're moving back. Verse 23. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And so being lifted up was being crucified. But being lifted up was also being glorified. His hour had come that he would be glorified, that he would be seen as the one, although the crucified one, he would be seen as the one above every other who could impart eternal life and forgiveness and everything that people needed uh, into their, their situation. And so we see those things lifted up, crucified and glorified. Jesus then goes on, and he uses the illustration of light and darkness. Go back to John 3, verses 19 to 21. He's okay, everybody all right there? We're just really, we're just really going through them because we know this stuff so well. Many of us could quote these verses. Isn't that right? Verse 19. And this is a condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. This is one of the main images that's used in John's Gospel. Light and darkness. We already looked at it in chapter 1, verses 4. This is that light that lighteth every man that comes into the world. We had touched on that or, or went through that on, on a previous evening. But why do people not come into the light of life? And Jesus says here, it's because they love the darkness. They want to keep on their evil, they want to keep on doing their evil, sinful de deeds. The closer that we get, you know, of course, the closer that we get to the light, the more we can see the flaws and the problems. The closer a sinner gets to the light, the more he or, see, he or she sees their sin exposed. And it's not intellectual problems that keep people from trusting Christ. The Word today would tell us that. Governments would talk about intellectual stuff. It is not intellectual problems that keep people from trusting Christ. It's a moral and the spiritual blindness and darkness and death that's upon them that keeps them loving the darkness and keeps them hating the light. And they need the Spirit of Almighty God. They need the Lord Jesus Christ to touch, to quicken, to bring life, to raise them out of that. And without that, they're bound completely and they are unable to do anything about that. Now, having said that, light and darkness, people are in darkness. Let me, let me move it on. We're coming to the next section. We're back in John chapter 3 again. We've seen Jesus as a teacher. Let's consider Jesus as a bridegroom. 
And we find that in verses 22 right down to 30. Now, I'm going to read this portion as well. After these things came Jesus, verse 22, and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Now what we have here in these verses is the fact that we have two popular preachers, if you like, in the one locality. John the Baptist, and people have been flocking to John the Baptist, and now Jesus has come upon the scene, and people are flocking to Jesus because of what they have seen and heard from him. Two preachers, forgive me for, for reducing Jesus to that, but it's just to, to make, make the point that I'm trying to put across here. Now, it appears in these verses that some of John's disciples got into a, a dispute or an argument on doctrinal grounds about purifying. And maybe David mentioned Nicodemus. You know, Pharisee, he wouldn't recognize John's baptism. Maybe that has got something to do with this, this kind of situation. But nonetheless, purifying was important to the Jews. We'll not take the time tonight to read it, but you will find that whenever you go into the like of, 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 of Mark's gospel, Mark uses 23 verses of chapter 7 of his gospel to talk about cleanliness, washing hands and pots and pans, purifying stuff that the Jews did, which they... They were told in the Old Testament to do, but the Pharisees had, had added, as we know, many other laws and things onto that. And they were completely over the top in all of that stuff. And, and Mark, as I say, Mark gives 23 verses, the first 23 verses of chapter 7 of his gospel to that. But that's what's happened here. It's some kind of a dispute about purifying. But then John's followers, they move this on from a purifying matter to a personal matter. Look at verse 25 again. Sorry, verse 26. They came unto John, the dispute had arisen, verse 25, verse 26, they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold the same, baptizeth, and all men come to him. And probably without realizing it, John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, were putting John into a position of competing with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see that? All men come to him. It's like a wheel of despair. People are going to him instead of coming to you. And sometimes well-meaning people can produce that kind of situation upon a leader. That can happen quite often. And you'll find different people in Scripture that that happened to. Paul was one of them. And you see, leadership, that, that, that's why whenever it comes to leadership, whenever it comes to having leadership together, whenever it comes to appointing people for leadership, that's why it's such an important thing. Because you need people with the right spirit, you need people with the right mindset, you need people with the right maturity and all of that to be part of leadership or part of leadership teams, should I say. Because if you don't 
have the right people there in place, this kind of friction or competition can rise very, very easily. And sometimes it can rise from a very, very innocent source that doesn't actually mean it to happen. And nonetheless, the devil can use it to materialize that. And that's the situation here. But look at how John the Baptist handles this. Look at verse 27. He answered and he says, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. John as good as says there, look, he says, All ministry and all blessing comes from God. And so there can be no competition in this whatsoever. I, I can remember in one of the churches we were in, we, 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 we had a box of, in, in those days it was four-track cassettes from Times Square Church. And they were all, you know, David Wilkerson, Carter Conlon and stuff like that. And we had them in a box and we had a book there. And the idea was, you see, a person could poke their way through them and if there was a title or a message that they wanted to listen to, they simply signed it into a book and they took it with them. And then they brought it back and took another one. And we had them sitting in the church and they were coming and people were, you know, taking them. They were going out and they were coming back in. And I had a fellow in the church said to me one day, Denver, he says, does that not worry you? And I sort of looked at him and I says, why? <laughs> because he says, those messages are David Wilkerson and they're Carter Conlon. And he says, you know, I says, oh, you don't have to say anything more. I says, I realize that. And I says, look, those men are what they are. And I says, they're in church, the church the size it is because that's God's calling upon their life. And he felt that I, I should be doing, I shouldn't have them there because my ministry didn't weigh up to theirs. It was as simple as that. That's what he was trying to say to me. Did it not worry me? But you see, there's no competition. No two people do the thing the same way. No two people present it the same way. But all ministry comes from God. And all blessing that's upon any ministry, whether it be greater or smaller, comes from God. We often hear in the minister's meetings, you know, there are pastors of 20. There are pastors with a call to 50 people. There are pastors with a call to 100 people. There are pastors with a call to 1,000 people. And none is less important as long as the person is surrendering to that call that's upon their lives. Because all ministry comes from Almighty God. And this can be a problem in church life. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And again, you'll know these verses as well. We're about halfway through this. <laughs> now nah, I'm only joking. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. See, Paul experiences exactly the same thing. Verse 1. Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Here's the same thought again. I have planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that gives the increase. The he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. All ministry comes from God. Look at the next chapter, verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord. 
Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Okay, and you see the same thing is being implied there. There's no competition. And we've got to be very careful about those kinds of things because all ministry, let me say it again, and all blessing comes from Almighty God. And then on the back of that, that's what John has said to them in chapter 3, and on the back of that, John uses this lovely illustration. And he compares Jesus to the bridegroom, and he compares himself to the best man. Look at verse 29. He that has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, the best man, which stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Once the bridegroom and the bride have been brought together, John's saying there, the work of the best man's completed. His task, his role's finished. And how foolish for the best man to try to upstage the bridegroom. And John the Baptist's joy was simply to hear the voice of the bridegroom and know that he had come to claim his bride. That's what John's saying there. You know, the story is told of a, of a Presbyterian minister. In, it was in Australia. It was in Melbourne in Australia years ago. And he introduced J. Hudson Taylor. J. Hudson Taylor was at his church to preach. And he got up to introduce and to welcome J. Hudson Taylor uh, before, before he would speak. And he, he built him up. You know, this man is this, and this man is that, and this man is the other, and this man has done great things, and all of those things. And he brought on Hudson Taylor. And the story says, Hudson Taylor stepped into the pulpit and said, I am the little servant of an illustrious master. I think that's beautiful. Hey, there was no big head as far as he was concerned. He was just a little servant. And again, the image of the bridegroom would be significant to Jews, for Jehovah had a marriage covenant with the nations. But we'll not, we'll not look at that. We'll move that on. But, but there, are, there are references there uh, for that for you. Isaiah 54, <coughs> have that? Yeah. And J Jeremiah 2, Jeremiah 3, and Ezekiel 16 and 8. That's where God speaks about his marriage, his bond, his covenant to the nation of Israel. So we want to we'll shift that on very quickly. We see him as teacher, we see him as bridegroom. Let's look at him very, very quickly as a witness. This is verses 31 down to the end of the chapter. Now, in these verses, let me say this. Commentators are not sure who's speaking here. Whether this is still John the Baptist who's speaking, or whether this is the Apostle John as he writes his gospel. The tail end of this chapter, no one's completely sure who it is who's actually saying these words. Verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no man receives his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loves the Son, and has given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Okay, so we're not completely sure whether this is still John the Baptist who's speaking, or whether this is the Apostle John just continuing to write uh, in, in, in his gospel. But that's not really that important, but the emphasis here is on witness and on testimony. And again, that's another key subject of John's gospel. 
The Greek word translated witness or testimony, John uses it 47 times. Should I, should I, I haven't moved on. Yeah, 47 times. It's over. I can't see the far side of the screen too well from here, you see. Okay, he uses it 47 times in his gospel. Now, John bore witness of Jesus, chapter 1, verse 7. We needn't go back there to look at that. In chapter 5, verse 33, John bore witness of Jesus, but Jesus was also a witness to the truth. And these verses give us several reasons why we should heed his witness. Look at verse 31. First thing is, you see, he came from heaven. He that comes from above. Now, let's understand the significance of this. You see, he was not simply called. You see, whenever you step into your Christian life, you have a call from heaven upon your life. And Jesus was not at all like that. He didn't have a call from heaven upon his life. Whenever you step into your Christian life, you are empowered from on high by the Spirit. You're empowered from heaven. Jesus was not just simply empowered from heaven. This verse says he came from heaven. That's what makes all of the difference. And the Jews disputed this claim because it was his claim that he was God. Look at chapter 6 very quickly, verse 38. You see, to claim this was claiming to be God. Verse 38 of chapter 6. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I shall lose nothing, but shall raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. You see, to come from heaven was a claim to be God. John the Baptist was not from above and never claimed to be from above. John the Baptist was born with a call upon his life, albeit the call was upon his life even from before his birth. But Jesus came from heaven. The second reason why we should heed him is because it comes from him <coughs> firsthand. Look at verse 32 and 33. What he has seen and heard, that he testifies. We're in chapter 3 again. And no man receives his testimony. In other words, it's not second-hand stuff. This is directly from him. What he has seen and heard, he testifies. He shares what he has seen and what he has heard. He that has received his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. Whenever you receive his witness and act upon it, you know by personal experience that his witness is true. And I think I've thrown you in a verse or two there. Have I as well? Yeah, chapter 8. We'll not read that for time's sake. Chapter 8, 38 and chapter 7, verse 17. Just highlight those same points. You see, Christ's teachings are not to be studied intellectually and separated from everyday life. It's whenever we obey his word and we put it into practice that we really see its truth and we experience its power. And that's what, you know, those verses are highlighting to us. And then the third reason why we should heed them is because the Father has authorized the Son. Verses 34 and 5. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He is authorized by God, sent them, God sent him, by the way, that's another key, that's an, a key thought that runs through John's gospel. God sent him. Verse 34, God gave him the word. Verse 34, God gave him the spirit, not by measure. And verse 35, God gave him all things. And there's another reference I've given to you there uh, in chapter 13 of John, verse 13, where Jesus talks about having all things. In John 3 and 16, we are told of God's love for the world. In verse 35, we are told here of God's love for his son. And he has authorized him and he has given him authority. The father loves the son and has given all things into his 
hand. I'm very aware of the time. That's why I'm just rushing through some of this stuff. Then number four, verse 36. We should heed him because we can escape the wrath of God through him. Okay. He that believeth in the Son has everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. An everlasting life we know is not just simply living forever. But the everlasting or eternal life that's spoken of in the Bible is a quality of life whereby we know God, whereby we are in God, and whereby we are a part of God. And I've rushed through that very quickly. There's one or two other references for you there. You can, you can pick up on that. That's if you work your way back through the notes. You can do that for yourself if you want to. Conclusion. Conclusion. Whenever you review this chapter and, and, and sort of summarize it and put it together, what this chapter does, he's the teacher, he's the bridegroom, he's the witness. And what this chapter does really is it speaks of personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are brought into a living relationship because of a new birth. We are brought into a loving relationship because he's the bridegroom. And we are the bride. And we are brought into a learning relationship because he witnesses the things of God the Father and produces them in our lives. And that's where we finish at this evening. And please forgive me for that because time completely run away. Perhaps we read one or two longer portions of scripture and stuff like that tonight that ran away with me completely. And that's why we had to rush through those things so quickly at the end.